Hello, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by your friend at Vita Health. We would like to remind you that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator who joins us from WTF Health, Jessica Damasa. Hi there, and welcome to Health Go Live, the virtual care experiment do virtual and value match. My name is Jessica Damasa. I'm the executive producer and host of a health tech talk show over there on YouTube. It's called WTF Health, What's the Future Health? And I say I talk to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. So lots of entrepreneurs, investors, and then incumbent innovators in this space. And so as you can imagine, I have spoken with a lot of people in the last two years in particular about virtual care. And I mean, all sorts of virtual care, telehealth, remote patient monitoring, digital health, digital therapeutics, chat technology, everything. And it seems like where we're at now at the beginning of 2022 is in a very different place than we were when we were talking about the value of virtual care back in, say, 2019. So as this conversation continues to evolve this year, I think we're going to hear a lot more about the way that value and virtual are lining up. And in particular, we're going to hear a lot more about the way that we are measuring the value of virtual? Like, is it the same way that we're measuring the value of in-person care? Are we just looking at ROI? And what happens to this whole value proposition for virtual, which for years had been an access to care thing? Is that evolving too? Well, we have put together a panel of experts to help us figure all of this out, start us off on the right foot this year so we can figure out exactly how we should have this value conversation, particularly as these incumbent organizations, payers and providers alike, start to look at what they bought during the pandemic and figure out if it was worth it and how to make it even more worthwhile moving forward. So please join me in welcoming this panel. From MVP Healthcare, talking about that payer side, we have Kim Kilby. She is the Vice President and Medical Director of Health and Wellbeing there. Hey, Kim. Um, from Willis Towers Watson, cluing us in on what those employers might be thinking, we have T. Montalva. She is the North American Health Analytics President practice leader for health and benefits. That's a mouthful. And rep in the health tech side from Vita Health, we have their chief growth officer, Vanita Lakhani. Ladies, pleasure to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> this is a big conversation, you guys, I think to kick this year off, because like I said, I mean, we saw in 2020 and 2021, I cover the health tech space, particularly the investment side of things. And we saw a lot of money pour into the space from all over. And so everybody's got a virtual something, it seems like now. And they're all looking what we started to hear actually at health um, at the end of the year. The word the word of health for me was omnichannel care delivery. And so what does that really mean? And so you can just imagine everybody's wheels turning on how they're going to figure out how to you know, create new value and assess old value in terms of the way they've implemented virtual in whatever care delivery organization people are in at this point, right? So let's kick this off. I want to have a conversation that's kind of far reaching on this because I think that this merit, this is a great time to really step back and kind of put this in context. So what I want to talk about with you guys is, you know, about the metrics that we're currently using to evaluate virtual care. I want to talk about that value proposition and how that's maybe evolving and where we might be missing some opportunities by not embracing a bigger kind of value proposition understanding for virtual. And then I want to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of like the what if for 2022, you know, as this whole idea of omnichannel continues to evolve for providers and for payers alike in terms of the way they're reaching patients and consumers. You know, what do we need to do to lean into these new metrics, the new value propositions, and what's possible if we do that? So that's kind of the structure I want to follow here. I want to invite the audience. I see you out there. We've got our Q&A open, so submit your questions. We'll be taking them as we go along if they're relevant to the conversation. If not, we'll park at the end and give you guys an opportunity to ask us some stuff there. But let's kick this off with like a state of play about where we're at right now. And so, Vanita, I'm going to hit you up first. I want to hear about these metrics because... I'm curious to hear from your perspective over there at Vita. I mean, you guys are working, you're, you're the health tech company, right? You're the one who, who's working this virtual care into the system. You know, are the, is the way that virtual is being measured right now, is it the way that we're measuring in-person care or are the metrics different than that right now? Give me a sense of where we're at here in 2022 at the top of the year. You know, how are we measuring the value of virtual today? 
Yeah, I think it's a great question. And thank you and happy new year to everybody that's out there listening to us. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you guys about this topic. I'm, I'm extremely excited about it. And if I'm to reflect on it, I think the state of play in virtual today is very access oriented. We measure things today like the number of visits. We measure things today like the time to get to a provider. I mean, this is very important in mental health where people have to wait days and days for appointments. They can't even find the right kinds of therapists or providers that they need. And so we measure things like the time to get to a, a human, um, the time to get to a proper provider, the time, you know, the time to have an appointment take place. Um, and we measure the number of visits. And, and I don't want to uh, you know, under club the importance of that. That is very important. It's been a, an age old problem for us. But what I would say is that virtual just cannot stop there, right? If what we're doing is effectively just taking our access problem and making it a little better by putting it into a virtual framework instead of an offline framework, we, we've sort of failed the real value of what we can do with virtual. And when I think about my kind of my career. I've um, spent time in the payer world uh, leading value-based care, and the framework for value is multidimensional, right? Access has always been an important element, but if you think about it, the way the IHI framed it up in the triple aim or sometimes um, recharacterizes the quadruple aim, which I think both concepts are really important, it's, it's multidimensional. So we do need to focus on the member experience. They, we, we want to make sure members are satisfied with their experience. I think access is kind of a component of that. Uh, but then you have to really look at, are we improving the health of populations and through, through what we're doing? And are we lowering its cost? And those are equally important. And then, you know, alongside that, are we improving the experience of the providers who serve? And so what I see in virtual today is that we have anchored on the access component of metrics, but have not really taken on in earnest the full set of dimensions that we need to in, um, you know, in terms of improving care. And I think the time is now we got to step it up. It's not we're not going to sustain uh, a new mode of care delivery using virtual technology if we can't demonstrate what it can do to improve the health of populations and to lower cost. And so we got to step up our game. Uh, it's kind of the way I see it. And that's where we need to go. Okay, I will take you there. Just hey, hold on a second. <laughs> First, I want to hear though. I want to get a. I want to get the round out of this point of view. So, Kim, chime in here on the on the payer side of this because I'm curious about your perspective on this. Like, what are the metrics that you guys are looking at? You know, state right now this day in terms of measuring the the value of virtual as it is, and then we will get into. I promise what should change and how it could change. <laughs> Yeah, I agree that a lot of focus is being centered currently on access and cost and all of the disruptive care models really are focused heavily on that. And but we're kind of at a, at a very pivotal moment because what I compare it to is, you know, the last two years, the in-person healthcare delivery system went through a rapid change and then rapidly back to the status quo. And I think one of the things that allowed that that phenomenon is allowing us to do is if we do what Vanita described um, and and actually you know build in and go beyond just saying we've provided better access but we can prove that we also have provided higher quality care or that we're reaching people that were previously unreached then we're actually doing something that a lot of times the in-person care modalities haven't been able to achieve those types of outcomes and you know so we're you know if you look at our utilization trends it's for telehealth medical cert that are in provided by in-person providers you know who had expanded initially the medical services are really mostly back to in-person visits with the exception of behavioral health where you know it's still 50 50 in person in telehealth but i think if we don't act now then we're we're losing this opportunity that will allow us to continue to further and improve upon care delivered to populations and not just sort of mirror what's been what's what exists today oh number of visits number of visits T, chime in here for me. State of play right now, metrics. What are the employers wanting to know? Is that what it is? 
Well, so employers traditionally have focused on volume, right? So volume has been so over-focused on where now we've seen a shift. And partly the shift is not only because volume has gone up substantially, engagement has gone up. The question now is ROI, but I really challenge some of my own clients to say, it's not just about ROI, right? So we've got to look at not just cost, but cost effectiveness in the longer term. So cost effectiveness is one key and where we're looking at um, outcomes. So are we seeing the right outcomes generated through virtual care, either from a chronic condition management standpoint, or are we seeing it from like a, an, an ability to reduce waste in the system? So if you're obtaining virtual care, hopefully, the idea is that we're measuring and not seeing duplicative care that should have been, um, should not have happened. So it's cost effectiveness, it's quality of care. And I think the third piece that's really important that employers are asking us to take a look at is does virtual care help to address health inequity? You know, health inequity from those that live in rural areas that didn't have access before, health inequity for those that may be of lower income and this um, convenience and access. And I know we're going back to access here, but there's so many components to access that are beyond just that timeliness of care, right? So there's, there's a whole component there in terms of health inequity that is looking to be measured. And we've started that with some of our more progressive employers. Okay, so let's talk about that. Then let's talk about, okay, some of the more progressive employers are starting to look at this. So we need to chime in now with kind of like, what what, what should we be measuring? Like if it's not some of these, these things that we have been looking at up until this point, to get at some of these, you know, some of the real value of what can be done with virtual care. And it is to say, we're defining virtual care broadly. So in addition to just telehealth, let's think about the digital health stuff, the remote patient monitoring stuff too. But what should some of these metrics look like? And one of the questions I wanna tack on to the back of this is, is a year enough time to look at some of this stuff? Because T, you even mentioned chronic condition and it's like some of this stuff, it's like, can you really make that big of a difference in a year? Like, I mean, what's the, what is the right time frame? So you need to kick us off. What should some of these metrics for really getting at the heart of how virtual is adding value to the system? It's different than bricks and mortar, right? So what, what should we be measuring? Yeah, I, you know, it's a balanced set of measures that we at least take on within Vita. We, we really try to look across the dimensions of enrollment, engagement, and outcomes, which I think represents the full um, spectrum of things you want to look at across the population. So enrollment um, is always about what, you know, if you've, you're, you're trying to impact care in a, in a population, what percent actually uh, you know, adopt the new thing you're offering. And that I think has been an important metric. That's no, I don't, I wouldn't consider that new, uh, so to speak. I think we've been measuring adoption for a while and definitely have some work to do uh, to make sure that we communicate things in the right way to an employee base, to a uh, large cohort of a health plan population uh, so that you get the most adoption that you can. And then beyond that, you wanna look at engagement and you wanna look at uh, outcomes. What kinds of clinical outcomes are you uh, achieving? You know, Is the population getting healthier as it relates to overall weight loss, overall medication adherence, uh, overall A1C results, um, you know, how much depression and anxiety is going down. You have to look at the, the holistic set of things that measure the health of the population and, uh, and make sure you have a perspective on that. So those are things we should be, but I think what makes it a little different from the, um, the offline world is that we gotta get away from the things that are, you know, what I call the old, school fee for service metrics, right? Tell us. So, you know, the visits, the, the visits, of course, are like the, you know, the thing that we all kind of hang on to. And the one thing at Vita we do a little bit differently is we think about, yes, we do look at visits. Everybody needs to take a look at what's happening, but you got to look at the connection behind that right? It is, healthcare is very human. It is about the connection between a person and it, and their provider and their care team. And so we look at things like therapeutic alliance. 
uh, which is effectively a measure of how strongly a patient feels connected to their provider team. So it doesn't matter if that connection happened over the course of one visit, 10, um, 10 different text messages, a few lessons that they've read, um, a connect, you know, some device measures, uh, meals that they may have uploaded that their uh, dietitian or care team has responded to. You can form connection. I think we can all relate to this in many different ways. It doesn't have to be a visit. And I think we have to look at that. We have to look at the kinds of longitudinal connections we can make uh, because that's at the heart of the value we're delivering. T pop in there. They look at you yeah, and I mean, go for it. Uh, along the same lines of connection, right? Like from, from an employer standpoint, connection in, in many ways means integration with their ecosystem of benefits. So in a virtual care environment, if that virtual care is providing, let's say a targeted mental health service, therapy, coaching, ideally that is connected back to their ecosystem, whether it be an EAP program, uh, the traditional provider that the member is seeing. But those things are so important so that virtual care is not the silo, but it's actually a journey that is more seamless uh, for that individual. And they're not experiencing just kind of a one and done transactional experience, if you will. So I think that connection piece, uh, Vanita, is very important. And I would say connection, integration may be interchangeable here as we talk about that. Um, the other piece here is, you know, what we should be measuring is value to the patient beyond access, right? So value to the patient is, you know, that connection piece, but also to what extent is virtual care meeting the needs of the patient as an inpatient, in-person visit would? You know, we would expect, and we would hope that it was at a minimum meeting the same uh, patient expectation and satisfaction that they receive in person. And if not, then where are we going wrong here? Because then you won't get that stickiness and engagement that's needed uh, for virtual care to really be effective. I was, I've been studying the, the idea of omnichannel because I like, I really do feel like this is like a, a this is going to be like the, the defining like theme of like a lot of conversations moving forward into this year. And just in terms of just how frictionless that experience should be, like if you're in, in a retail environment and you're shopping online or you're shopping in the store, it's a frictionless ex experience. Or if you're banking, it's frictionless. You can go to, a, you can go to the bank or you can do the banking online. Like it's just, it, that, that word is just so important. So I think figuring Figuring out a metric around that is going to be very critical, I think, in terms of trying to assess how virtual fits in to the way that we're delivering in-person care. Kim, I'm curious to hear from you, what metrics from the payer side uh, do you think are missing that you guys would like to see? Yeah, sure. And I'm, I'm, there's just so much to talk about and there's some <laughs> wonderful comments coming in in the chat. I do think yeah. that we have the potential to deliver higher quality care than some of the in-person alternatives, but really it, um, you know, I think a lot about the, the clinical outcome measures really needing to be prioritized as part of this maturation from adoption based thinking to quality-based telehealth metrics. And that's both on the individual level and the population level. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be really important for us to know with confidence how often clinical deterioration happens and was appropriately or inappropriately addressed and understanding, you know, at the population level, are we able to actually discover and manage things like drug side effects more quickly or more slowly. I mean, it, we have to just keep an open mind and measure it so that then we can advance it. And um, part of that is is maturing those, those clinical outcomes. Um, you know, before the pandemic, there was already work and a framework, the NQF, National Quality Forum, yeah. put together a framework in 2017 for telehealth me measurement. And I think we have to go back to, to the work that the playbook was already started and we need to go back and quickly advance it because I think we could lose the momentum um, that was provided to us and all of the virtual care solutions and innovations that have emerged out of the pandemic if we if we miss that step. I think we we have we don't have to reinvent the wheel. This, there's already been good, good, solid work going on this. And I think we have to just go back and say, okay, now how can we rapidly 
bring that forward so that there's standardization and the you know the the mature telehealth programs really should already like as Vanita had mentioned it already thinking about this and working on it and it's just making sure that we have some standardization so that we can start saying with confidence that something is more valuable say a little bit more though about the the need to do this right now because I, I, I mean, truly, like, I, I feel like Vanita alluded to that, T alluded to that. Like, I, why, why do we need to do this right now? I mean, like, if this window, clo- what is the window? And what, if it closes, then what happens? Kim? <laughs> well, I mean, I know why my concern is that um, what I think a lot about is that consumer preferences are, are forever shifted since the pandemic. Um, but that's in stark contrast to providers' preferences around how they like to, what they feel is high quality care, or how they prefer to provide care. And so what I'm, we're deeply intentional at MVP. That's why they have somebody like me, a physician in the role that I am and customer experience, because I know people are, consumers are migrating because it's, it's higher, it's more convenient and it's lower cost often. But what I worry about is if it's bad quality medicine, then we haven't done anything for people. In fact, we've added to the to the whole comprehensive problem. Um, And so, you know, I to me, I feel like if we don't bring the um, veracity to the measurement and so that we can have those thoughtful dialogues with the in person systems and and demonstrate high quality care, then you you will undermine all of this work that's been gone that put into bringing different care models forward. Um, Because the health the health systems kind of, you know, in some respects, resistant to this type of change, but the consumers are ready. Do you think though, just real quick before I let somebody else chime in, follow up for me and you guys can weigh in on all this, but I'm curious because like I've been hearing from folks that I've been talking to, it's like, well, they've put too much money into this now. They've made the investments, you know, they had to stand them up in 2020 and 2021. And it's like, have they really put in too much money or not? Like, what's your beat on that real quick? And then we'll, we'll bring the other ladies back into this. You mean the health systems? I think, the health system, I think yeah. there's, there's a wide range. And um, I can say that I think some were already moving down this path, the more forward thinking, innovative institutions. But I will tell you, you know, community hospitals, large places where a lot of people receive care um, are struggling to, to con- because of what we talked about before, the fee-for-service architecture, visit-based medicine is not patient-centered medicine, but it is how you keep your doors open. And so I think many institutions, even though they want to maybe evolve, are struggling with how to make that financially viable. So there's going to be this, this very interesting um, contrast between what's happening in the virtual care innovation space and the health system innovation space. Okay. Vanita, you want to jump in there? Why yeah. is the time now? And like, do you, and, and where do you, I mean, cause you're at Vita. I mean, you guys are one of these virtual care companies that's been invested in <laughs> over the last couple of years, you know? And so it's like, give us your, your thoughts on that. I mean, like why, why is the time now to, you know, to the health tech companies? I mean, probably for obvious reasons here, but I mean, do you agree with what Kim was saying too, about kind of like that, di- that dichotomy between, you know, the innovation in the virtual care space and the innovation in the health system space? Yeah, I think the time is now because we just don't want to end up being another shiny object that ends up in the graveyard. And I say that because, you know, we've we've all seen, you know, quote unquote, tech bubbles, right? We've all seen it. And uh, we've seen things kind of rise and fall. And there has been absolutely, uh, you know, the capital kind of flowing into virtual care is is just unprecedented. I think we've all looked at those statistics. The uh, deal flow in 2021 was impressive uh, in terms of all of the different things that have come about. Uh, And I, for one, just don't want to be in a place where we're just you know, feeding the feeding the madness of the next shiny object, and then you know, and then it dies. Uh, and I just that would just that I think is a shame, and that's not I think where we want to be, right? We've we've seen what technology can do for behavior change outside the healthcare industry. The time is now for it to have that kind of impact inside the healthcare industry. But the only way to do that is to get past 
um, the complacency, I don't call it complacency, but it is complacency around access and really look at the whole picture of value that you can deliver and, um, you know, and, and put some skin in the game um, as it relates to virtual. So, you know, we recently rolled out 100% fees at risk because we believe in what we do. And, uh, and we really are kind of backing that or backing that up with the way that we do business with our customers. And that's, it's an important, that's an important step. And I think we have to do that and we have to measure the outcomes behind um, behind the interventions. T, what would you add to this conversation about the, the timing for this? I mean, and, and knowing where you're coming from too over there at Willis Towers Watson, you know, and the perspective that you've got kind of hovering above all of this, I mean, weigh in for us, like what, what is the sentiment among employers? What's the sentiment there in terms of like what they're expecting and why it's important for us to get to get this virtual care thing done right, right now? Yeah, so it's interesting because for years we watched telehealth, virtual care kind of be pretty steady along. It was kind of like this line graph that was just like this, right? And we see this hockey stick graph happen. And I'm always, always very cautious of a hockey stick graph because you, you want to make sure that pattern is real. There's nothing else happening. And it's real, right? Because the pandemic forced that graph to happen in terms of telehealth visits just shooting up. Now with that, we got along not only acceptance from members or patients, if you will, providers, we had investments in technology. All of this came together as a result of a need from the pandemic to uh, provide care to others in a different modality. And then it, it perpetuated into this acceptance, I would say, of engagement of saying, this works for many people. This helps many people who before could not get the service they need or did not know that this would be a viable modality of care. So now is the time to say, let's make this stick, but we've got to measure it. So what are we making stick? What, what is working and what is not? So in that sense, we want to make sure that the virtual care um, environment, the care that's provided, like I said, it's integrated. It's not creating additional waste. It's not creating duplication. It is enhancing the care of the individual and it's producing the clinical outcomes that we would expect in-person care to produce as well, right? So we're getting that care compliance, whether it be chronic care condition, whether it be post-discharge from a hospital, right? So those things are really important and we've got to measure it so that we know what's working and we continue on that path. And for those things that aren't working, we quickly pivot and we don't create waste in a system that does not need more waste. What's the time frame on this? When's the window close? Year? Are we done at 2020? Does it depend on the pandemic? Somebody give me a sense of urgency here. <laughs> I, I mean, I say we are, we've already started now on measuring okay. and we continue, but we, we press the pedal all the way down and just go and Keep accelerate. Going. Yeah. Yeah. Kim, yeah. Nodding. Vanita. Yeah. Nodding. Okay. All right. I want to hear about value proposition. Before I do, I'm, I'm seeing these comments come in and there's a lot of comments that are leading us to a value-based care question. So don't worry, we'll get there, you guys, <laughs> watching this unfold before my very eyes. Um, I, want to, I want to talk about the value proposition change for a second here, because I think that this is, this is like the, the big point here, right? It's like, how do we get to that you know, patient-centered care? How do we move the value proposition of virtual past just an access thing? Like, how do you do all of those? How, how do you add the other three? of the quadruple aim onto the value proposition of virtual. So I want to talk about that. Like what, what should we be talking about instead? For those of us who are in this space and we're trying to make sure that that pedal gets pressed to the floor and that we are communicating the true value of virtual, what should we be talking about instead? Tish, I start with you this time. You look ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so value-based care. Uh, we should be talking about outcomes, right? So I mean, that's that's one of the that's one of the pillars of value-based care. But here in virtual, as we're measuring virtual, that clinical piece of outcomes, I think, is still lagging. We're still looking at really the leading indicators of you know, are people going and what's the cost differential. Whereas we really need to quickly shift to what are the outcomes. Are people following through? Are they coming back? Are these value-added uh, visits? Um, and you know, ultimately, are we seeing less spend in the system that should not be happening? I think that's that's where we definitely need to be. Do we have the right mechanisms in place for tracking that at this point? I and that gets down to the metrics, right? Of like source data and what's available and not. I would say in most instances, instances 
if we look across the spectrum of the different um, providers, point solutions that are providing the virtual modalities of care, yes, the data is there. It's a matter of getting that data and getting a hold of that data, mining it, and and setting out those metrics and measuring and remeasuring continuously on it. I, I would just um, add to that that I, I think we have more data now than we ever have. Uh, I think we've That's got good. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not to say that we are done. That journey of interoperability is a long one, and we we need to continue to do that, connecting the various sources together so we can really measure things. But if I really reflect on uh, virtual care and the data that is accessible, I mean, you can absolutely see. I mean, at Vito, we we look at everything. We're we're obsessed with. Um, how members engage and what their outcomes to, to these point are. And so we will look at what percent of the population is hitting a clinical outcome. What is a clinical outcome? You know, lower, uh, how do you measure uh, depression, lower depression and uh, lower anxiety uh, as it relates to the PHQ and GAD measures, uh, weight loss, uh, medication adherence. I mean, these are important clinical measures, A1C reduction. We now have, in addition to traditional, traditional access to traditional measures, we now have things like device data. Device data is very helpful, right? You get weight measures on a, based on a, on a frequency that doesn't, um, doesn't exist necessarily in the offline world. And we have that now. Uh, we have blood glucose data that comes in uh, on, a, on a frequency that is you know, much richer than what we have been able to access before. And so we really do have what I believe is uh, quite a lot of data at, at, our, at our fingertips to use and to look at. And, and we should be absolutely measuring that and making those very central to the measurements of success of the interventions. Kim, what would you add to that? I mean, in terms of that value prop changing. I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think, again, that maturation to having very solid clinical outcomes is going to be critical and, and easily produced. Because I also think about the thoughtful integration into in-person care and the brick and mortar options. And I call it the, the virtual to physical care continuum. I think that is going to be so key to the entire system's success where we're interdependent whether we like it or not and so i think a proof of concept uh, for one for the the clinical predominant workforce to say oh this is something that actually helps me take better care of my patient and doesn't make it harder for me to take care of my patient and allows us to rep, you know be able to also reach the, you know, the power of virtual care is its potential to reach people that are unreachable by our current um, options or have chosen to, to not for a variety of reasons. And um, I think once we have that understanding of who are we reaching that nobody was reaching before mm -hmm. through these different care modalities, the ability for clinicians and providers to see the, the virtual care as part of the overall care that somebody's receiving that might be some of theirs and might be some virtual um, really will help us move in a so that we're moving forward and helping people move forward in their health journey. So I, I agree with everything, but I would just add that sort of that that integration piece, the metrics are so critical to being able to get to get there. I want to come back to the integration piece in a second, but before we do that, I want to, I want to park for a second on that health, that, that access piece and getting in and delivering care to the people who you might not have otherwise found that line of, of talk right mm -hmm. there. I want yeah. to come back to that. And so something T said earlier about health equity and, you know, it's like, I feel like virtual keeps coming up in this health equity conversation as well. And like, this is that same thing we were saying, you know, oh, access to care, access to care, but does it really like is, is virtual's ability. I'd love to get your, your take on this all three of you is virtual's ability to help make an impact in terms of health equity is that legit in your mind or is that a little bit overblown or a little overzealous at this point what do you guys think i'm curious to hear you know can virtual really make the kind of industry-wide impact that we want on health equity and in, in making sure that the, the cost quality and access of care is there for everybody equally or is this just a little bit too much to be putting into the hands of virtual care what do you think 
I mean, I can start. I, I, I definitely think virtual has the ability to close some of the health equity gaps that we have today, right? Is it the end all be all to solve it all? I do not think so, right? There, it takes a lot more than just virtual care to solve the health inequities that we see. But what is available, right, is we talked about rural access being able to enhance that. What we haven't talked about is, you know, how are we addressing where there are limitations to technology, whether it be uh, tech literacy or just, you know, just a, uh, we have a survey out in Willis Towers Watson, a recent survey that showed older populations are less inclined to use virtual mm -hmm. care modalities, right? So like, how do we overcome that as well? So there are ways in which to do it. I think there are ways as well that we need to be careful and that we don't expand or create additional health inequities through virtual care by not addressing this. And addressing it could be things such as making sure that providers that are, um, uh, that are delivering virtual care are properly trained. You know, they're trained in knowing you know, how to be sensitive to um, individuals of different cultural backgrounds, um, non-English speaking. Um, they're trained in knowing about sensitivities to technology-based care. Right, and how they address that and how they deliver care in a medium that is like that provides that simplicity and clarity that's needed through virtual care. Nita, what would you add to that? Because I'm curious, especially with Nita's background, because like, I mean, I know you guys have, you guys have a, a, a really impressive relationship with Centene, you know, I mean, so it's like you guys work with, with populations that are, are typically underserved in a lot of ways right now. So, I mean, what are you seeing from your side? Do you think that virtual is, you know, is that ability to kind of, like we said, you know, resolve those gaps for health equity, is, is that power really there or is it a little bit ambitious? Yeah, I, I'd say there it's a tool and it is not a silver bullet. Uh, and I don't know that there is a silver bullet as it relates to the issue of health equity. It's going to take a village across the industry. Uh, Omni-channel approach. It, 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 it's an absolutely a village approach, right? We have to um, uh, really work together uh, to address the issue and keep it. Um, I'm, I'm excited that it has become as important as it is and we need to keep it there. What I would say is in the world of virtual, there are real barriers we can tackle. So at Vita, we have rolled out uh, the entire app in Spanish. And that means we didn't just translate it, right? We um, took into account the differences between uh, Caribbean Spanish and, um, and Mexican Spanish and the kinds of nutritional advice, you know, in particular that you would give uh, people of different cultures. And so, you know, there's a place where technology can just play such an incredible role because it can be more personalized. You can absolutely use use it to understand who is you know being served, what is their cultural background, what are their preferences from a language perspective. We worked really hard to convert a very strong percentage, like over 20% of our network is now bilingual. Uh, and we we did that because we have so much need uh, in the Hispanic communities and we have to, and, and so those are ways. We created peer groups as an example. There's another technology thing. Created peer groups of people um, who are of um, kind of the Latin background and have them uh, work with each other. And so these are steps you can take from a health equity standpoint. Language barriers, I think, are, and the personalization that you need behind them, absolutely uh, front and center for technology to be able to undertake. And, uh, and one that I think we should absolutely hold the bar on. Uh, the other is tech literacy. I think that that's a real concern. Um, but I think we have some uh, miscon like kind of misconceptions out there, like the over 65 population doesn't engage in technology. I think we've found that not to be true. Um, yes, it does. There is a certain, just like anything else, if you look within the demographics of the over 65 population seniors, there's a huge, I'd say probably two thirds that are just fine, you know, downloading um, and, and working in the mobile, mobile app context. COVID, I think, changed the expectations there anyway. And so, so that's moving along. And as uh, folks age in, I think we see more and more comfort with, uh, you know, the senior population using technology. But yes, there is, you know, say, call it the one third of that population that 
may struggle on uh, tech literacy, and you really just need to find support models. So, you know, we've gotten out there and, and rolled out a bilingual health guide service where we walk people through exactly how to download an app and, uh, you know, hit, you know, step by step in, in, in bilingual, like step by step um, over the phone, uh, and literally walk through how you do it, you know, how you how you work it, um, how you, so you really have to uh, put the put the support out there and give people the tools and not let's not get let's not be afraid of some of the tech literacy barriers and you know the uh, access to technology issues that are out there rather I think we need to kind of band together and um, see what we can do to tackle them and you know we have definitely made a lot of forays on that front so uh, you know those are just two examples yeah. uh, I think of places where you can take on uh, some of these barriers and and technology actually has some advantages uh, to, to, to offer in this space. Yeah. And I, I would just add that, you know, I, it's widely known that consumerization trends in healthcare leave out vulnerable populations. So we're actually starting from a place where we, we now have research on digital health trends and vulnerable populations as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, early data from the pandemic suggests that vulnerable populations can access and are accessing care in digital telehealth ways and may find it to be more effective. Several studies, you know, showed that they, it was more acceptable um, to the patients, even to the clinicians providing the care and significantly reduced rates of canceled appointments when telehealth was used. But there's, you know, major caveats that, again, science, this is one of the ways in which evidence allows to change in practice is that we study it and make sure that um, it is continuing to move in the right direction, because there were some studies with significant sociodemographic heterogeneity. Didn't mean that populations in whole were excluded, but that there was some some variation that deserves attention. And then, um, you know, if we have to understand all of that to make sure that we're not further exacerbating health disparities. Um, but I, I think the potential for meeting people in a different way uh, around language and culturally appropriate care is gigantic. And I love just hearing about what T and Benita are, are thinking about and doing because, um, that we may, this is another area where I think having worked in clinical practice and seen the limitations of how we approach people who come from different backgrounds and, and how that really isn't a, a comprehensive way of, of caring for somebody, how we can do that differently using technology, using thoughtful models um, and giving people options and choice. Okay, so I see that. I mean, I, th I think that's like one of those those beautiful things about technology in the sense that it does offer an opportunity to deliver, and you know, maybe it's higher quality care in the sense of the in the sense that it can be personalized based on a myriad of factors, and it can be done based on you know location, or it can be done based on language, or it can be done based on you know time of day, and you know those those different types of things. So okay, I'm, I'm glad that we've talked about that. I want to ask one other thing before I, I move along here and ask the audience if they've got any questions for us. But I, one of the other things I wanted to to address with you guys in terms of value that you know, when people are looking at, you know, whether wherever you guys are at here, you know, as we're talking about that value proposition of access, or we're talking about improved quality of care, what about the cost? You know what I mean? And it's like, I think everybody looks at virtual and they, there's a lot of conversation about this, particularly now, as we look to what's going to happen with reimbursement moving forward in terms of parity, or we look ahead at what's going to happen with state licensure and all of that. So, you know, as the, as the dynamics around the cost of virtual care change, over this year, what do we need to be thinking about there as far as communicating, you know, the, the value around the around the cost talk track? So T, maybe I'll start with you if you could maybe, you know, share your thoughts there on that. You know, I mean, I, I feel like when we hear from, you know, payers and providers, it's like there's different things that they want out of having a virtual care channel to reach their patient. But, you know, from, from an employer standpoint, I mean, obviously they're, they're footing the bill for this stuff. So what are you hearing in terms of the, the cost and the value there and the value proposition and how that might be changing? Yeah, I mean, the expectation is, is that the virtual care visit is going to be lower cost than the in-person, right? But beyond that, there's the secondary expectation that, and I've mentioned this before, and it, and it warrants men mentioning again, that the virtual care visit doesn't create waste. It doesn't create an additional visit that could have been one and done in person anyhow, 
right? So we want to make sure that there's not that waste that's um, being perpetuated. Now, the third piece on this, besides just being lower cost, not creating duplication or waste, will be the value that it br brings for employers in terms of integrating with their benefit offerings, right? Many employers have, you know, anywhere from three to maybe 15 different point solutions available to their employees, right? These point solutions could be anything from a diabetes care management, a digital solution, mental health. I mean, you name it, they've got it. Now, we need to make sure that this ecosystem is speaking to one another and that the individual is getting those touch points connected where they need to be connected, right? So that is very valuable. And then downstream, what that will result in will be lower costs because then it becomes an integrated holistic care that's effectively managing the individual. That would be the expectation from employers. Okay. And that's like easier said than done, I think at this point. <laughs> You you know what I, I know you do it. It's like, it's like, I feel like we've, that, I feel like last year I heard a lot about that. It's like, who, who was it? The Wall Street Journal that had that article about the 30 different point solutions that employer had that suddenly yeah. appeared in yeah. everybody's deck ever, everywhere. <laughs> the, the, the great news is that you can measure it now. I mean, five, maybe even five years ago, you couldn't, right? You, we had to select what we wanted to measure because there were so many voids in data and inability to get data. Now we've got transparency laws. We've got um, data vendors that are willing to give the data because they, they know everybody else is doing it. So there's this big movement on data as currency for our employers, for the healthcare system. And that's where I'm saying we accelerate, we don't pull back. We continue to accelerate the measurement um, piece for, for virtual care. All right, Kim, I'm coming to you on this cost thing too, because I'm curious on the payer side, how this is all going to shake out because you know what I mean? I mean, it's there and it's like, I, even earlier this year, I saw, you know, Amwell did a survey based on like the, the buying habits of providers and payers and what they were looking at for 2022. And one of the things that I know that payers was, were looking at was engagement. Like they wanted more member engagement because they wanted people to, you know, obviously come in with something early, <laughs> do it in a virtual way that was less expensive and, you know, hopefully go from there and get things resolved before they became more expensive, more serious, you know, things like that. So, I mean, from your perspective, you know, how are you looking at that cost value proposition for virtual? Yeah, I think we should also hear from Vanita on this because they're- Oh, we will. It, but, um... <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you from my perspective, I'm a primary care physician, so I think about the frustration that consumers are feeling in the current healthcare system and that the providers, the primary care providers are feeling in their inability to fully help people on um, day to day. Really, you know, we are at this place where it, it found it threatens the very foundation of preventive care. But the, the problem, the main problem with that is that the areas of the country with higher ratios of primary care to specialty providers have better outcomes, lower costs, lower hospitalization rates, and improves patient satisfaction. So I think, you know, from a health plan side, we think a lot about unnecessary specialty care and um, systems that that move people in direction of, of really higher level care than they need. And part of the reason they're skipping over primary care is because they're so unsatisfied with it. It's not, it is also not giving them what they need, but if done well, could. And so I think from a cost perspective, I think a lot about that, um, because I do believe that primary care and virtual really innovative virtual primary care models give the, the family doctor back their role in the ability to really manage a person's overall care plan and only pull in specialty care when it's when it's absolutely necessary. And so it can has the potential to stop all this fragmentation, which only drives up costs and give give people a, a relationship with a primary care team back. Um, and so, you know, that to me is where we will be able to, to demonstrate savings um, ultimately. That's really patient friendly and patient. That's friendly. that duplicate waste thing that I feel like T keeps talking about too, is just making sure that there's somebody who's kind of quarterbacking this stuff. All right, Benita, hit us with the answer here on the call. We, we, I've saved you for the end because I'm like, let's go with the answer. Uh, yeah. No, I um, I agree with what uh, both T and Kim are saying on this. Um, the first bar on cost is don't increase it. <laughs> <Let's not laughs> I mean, we may increase certain 
good aspects of costs. I mean, you want people doing preventive visits. You want them taking their medications if they're not taking their medications. Those are aspects of cost we want to see go up because in the long run, we will, you know, it, it should result in lower total cost of care. But to Thee's point, you know, the danger with all the virtual innovation is that it's just adding costs to the system and it's duplicating what we're already doing. And we don't want to do that. And that is the first bar. So I uh, wholeheartedly subscribe to that as being kind of one thing we need to make sure uh, to, to manage. And then what I would say is from a cost perspective, let's not be afraid of it. We absolutely should look back on the impact of all virtual interventions on longitudinal costs, especially when they are designed and targeted at chronic disease and mental health and the combination thereof. I think one of the challenges we run into when we're measuring costs is that we or bucket things into um, all these different silos and you don't know what's impacting what. What's really the, the driver of that trend? And as much as you try to solve that through statistics and control groups and risk matching, you, you never get you know, a perfect, uh, complete picture. So I don't think we should be afraid of that. We should, we should absolutely do those look backs and have an expectation on ROI and have an expectation on trend savings, but in the right time frame and for the right cohorts, right? If you're gonna be looking at preventive populations that are not utilizing, you're not going to see a lot of savings show up in the short term, right? You're going to have to look at that over a much longer horizon. And I think we struggle with that, right? Because, you know, we just, patience is, is not exactly where you, you want to be when you're making an investment, right? You, 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 want to, you want to know the answers fast. And so I think what we need to lean in on uh, to judge the value of what we're doing is the leading indicators of cost, like back to the outcomes, right? Are we actually improving um, you know, the health of the population along all the different clinical measures that we can actually measure now because those things do lead to lower cost in, um, in the long term, we should lean into that. But that really ought to be primary, not, not uh, the only thing we do, but what we do in the short run. And then in the long run, we're really doing the longitudinal look backs on costs that we need to, but just making sure that we're, we're practical about what time frame we can do that in. That's really important. I think uh, real quick, I'm going to park here for a second and take a question from the, the crowd here. And there's been quite a few in here. And if we don't get a chance to address your issue directly here, I mean, we can be in touch afterward. We will have a copy of these. So we will reach out. Um, but I'm curious to know, you guys, there seems to be a lot of questions about, about this data exchange and whether or not we have the ability to get the data that we need, not only to establish these metrics, but also measure the metrics, like where is this data coming from? And is it flowing, you know, in a way that is, I guess, like, in a way where we can get a clear picture of what exactly is going on so that we can look at outcomes, so we can look at costs, so we can look at access and that things really are integrated in a seamless way. Are we there yet with that? Or where are we? Maybe give us a state of play on where we're at real quick in terms of the data that um, that the data exchange that we need to look at those metrics, get the numbers, and then really determine whether or not the value is there in terms of virtual care. V Vanita, you want to maybe cut, kick us off? Or T, T I saw movement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to from an employer's perspective. Um, in the way that we we obtain data today is um, from our employers, um, vendors, or carriers, right? So they're either providing it through um, a mechanism that flows into a data warehouse, it's all de-identified so that it protects the privacy of the individual. And then, but it allows us, it's the detailed claims data and uh, engagement data, activity data, where there's a unique identifier that allows us to look at patterns of care, patterns of behavior and outcome that then can measure effectiveness. That's one way for employers that do have a data warehouse. For those that don't, um, we take in the data, my team takes in the data as we were, would be like a data warehouse, if you will, for a discrete analysis. And then we look at it in that same mechanism. I think the most important thing here, uh, two points, data is available, right? So the source data can and do provide it today. And second, it's protected. So there's no individual um, PHI that's being exposed to the employer or anybody of, of that uh, for that matter. It's really at looking at the analysis to see what's working and not at an aggregate level, um, but in a, at an integrated level as well. Okay. Either one of you want to weigh in real quick because I've got one last question to wrap this up. 
Nope. I think we have work to do in getting the, the clinical data integrated between payers, vendors, and healthcare providers. That's where we're going to be able to get the most value because if we are integrated with the domestic network and place, we, we need to, it, it's incumbent upon successful clinical data integration. I think there's lots of things that are bringing us forward in that, um, at, but there's work to do. Yeah, I've believed and I always and I still do today that the data we access is really first and foremost the patient's data. It is um, and we have to earn the right and earn their respect and earn their trust uh, to use that data. And I think we've got good safeguards in place for that. Um, we fight over it. Like, is it the payer data? Is it the employer data? You know, the, the rules say, you know, who owns what? And it's the patient's data. It's the patient's data. This is information about their health and they own it. And we have to, uh, you know, the bar for trust and privacy is all about what, you know, whether they entrust us with that information. And that's what, that's the bar we have to cross. So I've always believed that. I think we're making progress towards it and just need to continue doing that. All right. My last question to you guys, we got to go lightning round because we've got five minutes left is this. All right. So we said pedal to the floor. We got to Get this done, right? To the finish line to prove the value of virtual in 22. So this is not a shiny object. So budgets don't get pulled. So the world does not fall apart. Where do we start? All right, Kim, let's start with you. What do, what's your advice? What's your advice to those who are watching our engaged audience? Thank you, by the way, for all of your chat. Love to see this coming through. We're watching it. Can't wait to go back and read it. But it's like, I, I imagine I have an audience here of folks that are either in virtual and innovating, trying to push those things into the health system, or I've got a whole audience of incumbents who are trying to pull those things in from the virtual care companies, right? So what's your yeah. best advice to them in terms of how do you get 22 going so that it's go time right now? Like, what's your best piece of advice in terms of determining the value of virtual? So I, I think, you know, going back to the playbook that was already developed before and um, for the innovators and the digital tech companies, they need to, that are not aware of the standards or the direction that was already we were moving in for clinical data outcomes. They need to get, do their homework and get up to speed very quickly. Partly because it, I will say it's, it's less common that they, that anybody who has an offering is coming in leading with that. Um, I do think it, it's okay that they don't have the outcomes yet, but they have to at least have a framework for how they are measuring and assessing the impact of their programs. Otherwise, you know, they're going to, we're, we're all going to be behind. So I think um, it needs to start now with a plan for how that's happening. And then, you know, having some standardization among these clinical outcome measures will also be critical. All right, T, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Kim says and, and said, and that framework is available. So it's not about restarting something or starting something from scratch. It's the National Quality Forum um, paper that was published back in 2017, right? They had this whole framework for measuring telehealth. Start there and then start to identify where you have data today and where you expect to get data tomorrow and what you can measure now, what you can measure in the longer term. I think that's the best way to get started as soon as possible if you haven't already. All right, Vanita, you're talking to clients every day about this. Yeah, so what are you telling them? Where do they start? You're like, don't worry about it. Vanita's got it. We'll handle it for you. <laughs> I, I would say, I just, if I had one thing to say about this, I said, you know, if you're in the space of virtual care, you got to put skin in the game. Um, so it's back to the concept of fees at risk. Uh, this is kind of not about empty promises anymore in virtual care. We've got to deliver value. It's got to go beyond access and you've got to put skin in the game. So it is all about the value-based constructs and um and let's start let's start there uh i literally got goosebumps when you said skin in the game i love this i love how far we've come <laughs> Awesome. Well, ladies, thank you so much for your perspective. I mean, truly, I think this conversation was just so dynamic. I mean, I feel like we covered so much and I hope that our audience enjoyed it as much as I did. It was fun to ask all the questions. Um, well, again, hopefully get, be able to get in touch with you guys afterward to, to answer some of those questions that may have been left behind. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for participating in the chat. Ladies, thank you to you guys. This was a phenomenal opportunity. I'm happy to have you all here. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks to Health for hosting right. us. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you to all of our panelists, Vita Health, and everyone in attendance today. Please visit our website, 
at hlth.com to catch up on all Health Go Live webinars. And join us at the inaugural Vive event, the industry's new health information technology event, coming to Miami Beach, March 6th through 9th, 2022.